Mark says it, and Luke says, and, and, and Matthew says it, following Paul. And John doesn't say it. He said it was an act of love to show us how much Jesus loved God. He gave up his life. So two of the Gospels follow Paul's, what's become the dominant Christian theory, but it's not the only Christian theory about what the blood achieved on the cross. But it's the dominant one, to pay the penalty for our sins. Uh, but that was Paul and picked up by Mark and Matthew. This book of Mark was known as the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It was attributed to Mark later, but it was written around 71 AD, and the stimulus for the writing of it was the news reached Rome, and Mark probably wrote in Rome. He was part of the Christian community of Rome, the assistant to St. Peter, who was a fisherman and ignorant, and, and Mark was a, a very sort of a young, uh, I won't call him a, a scholar, but he was a sh sharp young man. And I think he was Peter's secretary. And he was in Rome, and the news reached Rome that the great temple of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, this vast structure. And I, coming down with my movers tomorrow, is a model, a scale model this big of the temple as it looked at Jesus' time. And I'll bring it in during the latter part of this course. And Mark also knew that the two great leaders of the church in Rome, Peter and Paul, had been killed by mad King Nero, blamed for the fire in Rome, set by Nero probably. But remember, the Christians had been claiming the world would end in fire, apocalyptic eschatology. And when Nero burned Rome, he could easily blame it on the Christians. And he did. And there were terrible atrocities, uh, torturing the Christians to death, you know, in throwing them to lions and all that horror. Paul was beheaded and Peter crucified upside down. He asked for that so he could suffer more than Christ. Well, they were dead. The great heroes of the church. Little Mark, no longer a teenager, it's 40 years later. But anonymous until now, decided to take, to write, to take pen in hand and to write the story of Jesus' life. And so I imagine he sent out, and now, and by the way, the temple's destruction also triggered this because Jesus had predicted the temple would be destroyed, as Jeremiah had 600 years earlier. And now it had been destroyed. Oh, Mark said, everyone has to know he was right. If he was right about that, then he's right about everything. And everyone has to know who he is. Gentiles have to know. Jews have to know. Christians have to be reaffirmed in their faith, whether they're Jewish or Gentile Christian, they must have a book to tell them the story of the life of Jesus. So I believe this is what happened. He was sitting at a desk like this, but made of wood, no doubt, and he sent out the call. If anyone in the Roman Jewish community knows any stories about the Savior, that he write them up on scraps of parchment and bring them to me. If your Uncle Harry was there and he told you what being with Jesus was like, told you stories of sayings and miracles and healings, bring them to me. And at one point, I think he sat at a desk and he had a pile of parchment fragments, healing stories, miracle stories, beautiful sayings, fights with the Pharisees, Interaction with the high priest. Interview with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. All kinds of stories. And then he sat down and he put them all in his book. He put two versions of feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. One group of Gentiles, one group of Jews. He must have heard it. I think Jesus did it once. But he must have had two versions of it. And one old codger says, I was there, and they were all Jews. And then another old codger comes in and says, I was there, and they were Romans, they were, they were Greeks, they were Gentiles. And Mark says, what to do? I'll put them both in. And he did. Well, I remember he crossed the Sea of Galilee, and he said the following things. No, I remember he was the Sea of Galilee, he, he walked on the water. Hmm. How many water crossings could there be? 
I'll put them both in. And that's what he did. And he created a synopsis of scenes. It's not likely that Jesus had five run-ins with reactionary Pharisees Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But that's the way John, Mark puts them together. He's a neat freak. Everything is organized. And those were probably run-ins throughout Jesus' life, but he puts them in one week. Uh, and like that, was it likely that Jesus was in Jerusalem periodically during his lifetime? The Jews, Jews tried to get to Jerusalem on pilgrimage holidays? Yes, but Mark wanted to arrange it all in one week. It's not likely, but that's Holy Week, and that's our tradition. Not in John, but in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are so-called because they follow the synopsis of scenes in Mark, but they drop in additional material, which we'll talk about later. Matthew for a Jewish audience, John, uh, Luke for a Gentile audience. The church had two missionary outreaches into the world, bring in the Jews, bring in the Gentiles. Luke was bringing in Gentiles, Matthew Jews. All right, what is the purpose of writing it? Well, someone's got to tell the story before everyone dies off. And Mark appointed himself, thank goodness, to do that. And he's given us a sublime piece of literature. You can't find your way, as I said, the first day of this class around the museums of the world or the concert halls to appreciate the art and sculpture and music of Western civilization unless you know the story that Mark put together for the first time. So this little nobody in the church produced a work of genius. It's the shortest gospel, succinct and very clear. Probably the most accurate. Probably written in Rome, and the audience is the general Christian community, some Jews, some Gentiles. He wants to introduce us to Jesus. Now, when you open the book and start reading, which we'll do next week, I would say you try to have to cleanse your mind. Pretend you're one of those Romans who's hearing about Jesus for the first time, and you want to know who he is. I know you've heard from your childhood who he is, but did anyone ever define the terms for you? He's the Son of God, well, what does that mean? Messiah, what does that mean? Lord, what does that mean? Son of Man, the most mysterious title, what does that mean? No one ever questions anything. It's like in philosophy. Everyone says what time it is. Is it three times, many times a day? What time is it? But only the philosopher asks, what is time? That's a question. What is time? Think of that. Well, what do all these Christological titles mean? The three Christological titles, Son of Man, Son of God, Messiah. We're going to analyze them until you know them backwards and forwards. All right. He introduces us to Jesus with those three terms. And as we come across them in the Gospel, I'll talk about them in detail. We have to look to the Old Testament, because that's, Mark was a Jew. All the Gospel writers, with the exception of Luke, were Jews. So Mark could only know these three titles as he learned them as a Jew, and he's applying them to Jesus. Did he change them? Are they the same? We'll look at it. The structure. He begins with the baptism, which is the coronation of Jesus as king of Israel, ends with the empty tomb. There's no, there are no, in the original Mark, it says the women went to the tomb, it was empty, the stone was rolled away, and they fled away, frightened, and told nobody. But of course, thank goodness they told people, and they came running too. But that's not in Mark. The end of Mark is the empty tomb, and the women running away. Somebody years later added resurrection appearances to make Mark connect to the other Gospels which have resurrection appearances. But that wasn't originally part of Mark. And when you read your text, you'll see there's a, an open white space between the empty tomb and the description of the resurrection appearances to say these were put in later. Begins with the baptism, ends with the empty tomb. In between a series of events topically arranged, topically, not chronologically. We don't know the chronology of Jesus' true three-year career. They're arranged topically. Healings, sayings, water crossings, 
feeding people, uh, pronouncements on Sabbath, pronouncements on food, and then the last week of his life, conflicts with Pharisees, all topically arranged by Mark, dropped into a sequence, a synopsis, and synoptic gospels. A series of events arranged by Mark, miracles, encounters with Pharisees, Sadducees, Romans, common people, teachings, and healings, arranged according to Mark's druthers. So we don't know the sequence in Jesus' actual life, and there's no way we can know it. Second gospel, Matthew, the Jewish Christian gospel, late first century, maybe 85 AD, may have been written in Antioch, which was the great church center in Syria. And Matthew is an anonymous Jewish Christian who knows Judaism and the Old Testament very well. His point in writing is to convince his fellow Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Most of them didn't agree because the Messiah was to usher in the end of the world and or a new world and bring Israel all together in Palestine and 80% still lived outside at that time and end hunger and poverty and hatred and racism and prejudice and war and all the negative things and Jesus didn't do any of that. The church recognizes he didn't and so it says he'll come again and do it and that's in the future. But he's trying to convince them to accept a new definition of Messiah, the one, the one who suffers and dies for the sins of the world. That was not part of the Jewish expectation, totally alien. But Matthew wants them to buy into that. And ultimately, the, the group of Jewish Christians who gave that new definition of Messiah were so different from other Jewish groups that they broke off and founded their own religion, the way the followers of the Buddha, who was a Hindu, ultimately broke off and founded Buddhism, a religion that got bigger than the original Hindu religion, as Christianity has outpaced Judaism in numbers. It is also a handbook. It's to win Jews over, but it's a handbook on how to be a member of Christ's church. The word church does not appear in Mark at all, but this is a church handbook. The word church appears frequently. Uh, upon this rock I build my church. How do you act as a member of Christ's church? Matthew tells us the Sermon on the Mount, which does not appear in Mark, the original gospel, is a composition. Is it a composition of Matthew's? Is it a collection of authentic Jesus sayings? Either is possible. It certainly wasn't given as a speech at any one time together. Matthew must have taken Jesus' teachings from his, throughout his life that people told him about and put them together in one sermon. The individual parts of the sermon are ethereally beautiful, but as a sermon it doesn't hold together at all. So we suspect they are individual statements of Jesus all put together for the for the sake of brevity and order into the Sermon on the Mount. And that's only in Matthew. Well, Luke has a version, but Luke puts it, makes it the Sermon on the Plain, on the field. Why would Matthew call it the Sermon on the Mount, considering his audience? Who else spoke from a mountain? Moses. Moses. And the whole point is, Jesus is the new Moses, the Savior. Moses led us out of Egypt to the Promised Land. Jesus leads us out of slavery to sin and Satan into heaven. Parallel. So he puts them on a, on a mountain. Luke gives us a very similar version of the Sermon on the Mount. Not exact. But his point is Jesus was a man who shared our humanity. So he puts, makes it the Sermon on the Plain. He's on the same level we are, at least in terms of his humanity. And so he changes it. So you see, the Gospels say different things, and it's all symbolic, mountain or plain. I don't know where Jesus was when he said these things. Probably 10 different places 
but they put them together, mountain for Moses, plain for common humanity. Which, was, which is accurate? Impossible to know. The audience, Jews and Jewish Christians. He wants to say Jews, Judaism, Jesus is the Messiah, and here's the evidence for it. Endless Old Testament quotes that Jesus is supposed to have fulfilled. He's the Messiah foretold in Hebrew scriptures. Jews, pay attention, join up. Structure. He doesn't begin with the baptism. He begins long before the baptism. He begins with the genealogy of Jesus going back to Father Abraham. A Jewish genealogy, because Abraham was the first Hebrew, later known as Israelites, later known as Jews. He's giving Jesus bona fides as a son of Israel and the king of Israel. It goes through David. King, so he's descended from Abraham and through David. So he's an Israelite par excellence on the beginning of the newer, new Israel. Abraham followed the, founded the old Israel. Jesus founds the new Israel. But he is also of David's line. He's the king of Israel. A Jew, Jewish genealogy. Doesn't go back to Adam and Eve, just to Abraham. The birth of Jesus to a virgin is told us for the first time in Matthew. Infancy narratives. That is the uh, manger. His baptism. Well, actually, no, there's not a manger. It's a house. In Matthew, it's a house. In Luke, it's a manger. He gives us a fuller Christmas story. His baptism by John the Baptist. See, he picks where Mark starts. Matthew is already far into the narrative about Jesus. Then his adult career, following Mark. But Mark, Matthew elaborates on Mark. He drops into the story sermons by Jesus on Jewish themes, stressing good works rather than faith. Paul said, you are justified by faith alone because no one has any good works because your motivation even for doing the right thing is wrong, self-aggrandizement. You can't trust in your own righteousness. You must trust in God's righteousness as exemplified by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That's Pauline Christianity, saved by grace saved by faith in God's righteousness. But Matthew is so much a Jew. Paul was a Jew, but he didn't think Jewishly. Matthew did. And the parables of the kingdom say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. Not everyone has faith in me as Christ. But who will enter then? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When did we do that, Lord? Even as though that was done to the least of these, my brethren, that was done it to me. You're saved by good works. That's Judaism. Matthew's Jesus is a Jewish rabbi who preaches Judaism. Very unlike Paul. Jews do not believe in salvation by faith. Jews believe atheists can be saved if they do good works. If you serve your fellow man, you're okay. Actually, Jewish literature actually has, a debate, has the angels coming to God and saying, God of Israel, which would you prefer? That people worship you and don't help their fellow man? Or people do have good works and help their fellow man, but don't believe in you? He said, immediately, I choose the second. Because through helping people and being compassionate, they're serving me, even if they don't know it. So that's what counts, your good deeds. And that's what Matthew believes. So it's a, it's a Jewish Christianity in Matthew, not Paul at all. Although Matthew does believe that Jesus' blood is shed for our sins, that's not sufficient. You also have to respond to that with good deeds. He had sermons and teachings aimed at a Jewish audience, ma a, a morality sayings. The Jews love ethics and morality, so he puts it in. Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospels, but also the most anti-Jewish of the Synoptic Gospels. He's the one who includes, among all this beautiful stuff, the toxic line, having the Jewish crowd cry out, may his blood be upon us and upon our children. And that one line, is probably responsible for
for more murder and death and persecution of Jews for the last 2,000 years than anything else ever written. It's poison because in order, Matthew at the end says, look, I don't think the Jews are going to convert anyway. If we blame the Romans for the crucifixion, we want them to convert. You don't convert people by accusing them of illegal murder. Therefore, he invents the scene where Pontius Pilate washes his hands. I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. It's as if the Jews crucified Jesus, which is an absolute lie, completely inaccurate. Crucifixion was a Roman punishment, and the Jews had no power in Palestine to, to carry out a death sentence. And the Jews were on Jesus' side anyway. The high priest wasn't. But. So he figured if we bl can't blame the Romans, because that will ruin our attempt to convert them, the Jews aren't going to convert anyway, so let's blame them. There's no one else there. So he shifts the blame to the Jews, and that's what Christian children were taught until 1965. The Jews killed God, and no, no, no matter what you do to them, is not too terrible. And that's how Hitler got, a, got, a, got away with murdering the Jews of Europe. He, he succeeded. He wiped out the entire Jewish population of Europe, except for he didn't get to Russia completely, but six million people. Hitler said, I'm going to kill all the crippled people. And the church said, you can't do that. And he stopped. He said, I'm going to kill all the retarded people. You can't do that. And he stopped. Well, I'm going to kill all the Jews. Well, they killed God, didn't they? That's what people believe, this nonsense, that every Jew ever born was born with that curse on his head because of what that hand-picked crowd shouted, allegedly, may his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, I don't think anyone ever said anything like that, but Matthew puts it into their mouth. My father's first contact with Christianity was being beaten almost to death by a group of kids coming out of church in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania on Holy Week, having been taught that Jews were Christ killers. They see a Jewish kid, they try to kill him. Poison. And it wasn't until 1965 that the church acted to completely remove this false teaching and they declared it a false teaching. And the Episcopal Church has declared it a false teaching. And every mainstream denomination has declared it to be false. Now that's not easy after 2,000 years of preaching that. But the Holocaust, the murder of the Jews of Europe, so shook the churches up that they realized their part in preparing the way. Nazism was not a Christian operation, but it couldn't have succeeded had 2,000 years of Christian Jew hatred, especially the Catholic Church, not been promulgated. And the church view acted has acted magnificently to cleanse itself of all of that and today my catholic students can't believe that catholicism ever taught that because the catholic church and the protestants are closely allied with the jews and very very friendly or else i wouldn't be teaching in the christian church and at our jewish theological seminary we have priests and ministers teaching at christian seminaries you have rabbis on the staff it's a new world of brotherhood between these two faiths but it didn't come easily after 2,000 years. And it's that damn sentence in Matthew that's responsible. Tragic. I wish to God he hadn't said that. It would have made history so much different. Jews and Christians could have understood each other and come together 2,000 years ago, not now. Not, they didn't have to wait till now. All right, page five. The Gentile Christian gospel, which is Luke. It's written for a non-Jewish audience. The author is the only non-Jew writer in the, Old, in the New Testament. A learned Greek, he knew his Greek very well. All the Gospels are magnificent, but Luke is the most beautiful in Greek. He may have been Paul's traveling companion in Paul's second journey through Greece as a great Greek, Greek linguist. Why do we say that? Because in the book of Acts, Luke wrote two volumes. Gospel of Luke, book of the Acts of the Apostles. In the book of Acts, it says, and then Paul went across Asia Minor, and then we crossed to Europe, and we went down the coast of Greece. 
These are called the we passages. Doesn't mean small passages. It means instead of saying he, suddenly it's we. And we figure that's Luke who wrote the book saying I was with Paul. So we say we. So many scholars believe that. Others believe he found a diary by Paul's, another guy who was Paul's traveling companion and just put it in. But I think Luke was too elegant a Greek stylist to have picked that up. I think he probably was with Paul during those sec that second journey in Greece. It's written about 85 AD, more or less the same time as Matthew. I think perhaps a little later, but I'm not sure. I don't think that he and Matthew knew each other. The place is completely uncertain. We don't know where it was written. The audience is not Jews, but Gentiles. He is at pains to show not that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He doesn't care because he's not a Jew. He has to show Jesus is the world redeemer. Until then, the Jews had stuck much to themselves. There had been efforts to convert others, but with the circumcision requirement and the strict Sabbath observance and the kosher laws, the Jews for a while had success, but not ultimately. Christianity had Jewish ethics without all those rituals, and so they swept the world. But now Luke has got to show that Jesus, this Jewish carpenter that Greeks had never heard of, was the savior of the world for the Greeks as well as the Jews. So the, he, be, he begins with a genealogy and the genealogy doesn't begin with Abraham, Jesus' genealogy, his family history. It begins with Adam and Eve to show he's not just the Messiah of the Jews, he's the savior of all the descendants of Adam and Eve. Brilliant. And he traces it from Adam and Eve. So Luke is the first volume of a two-volume classic Greek-style history. It's a history of the activity of the Holy Spirit. Now, this may sound strange, but the truth is that Jesus Christ is not the main character in the Gospel of Luke. The Holy Spirit is. Luke has three, and we'll, we'll do Luke sometime soon. Luke has three eras of the Spirit. Eras of the Spirit of God. The first begins with the first few lines of Genesis. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is the outreach of God into this visible world. It begins with Genesis, the Spirit active. All through the book of Genesis, Exodus, all the rest of them, the prophets get the Spirit and become great spokesmen of God. God says to Moses, you're about to die, choose Joshua. Ish asher ruach bo, a man in whom is the spirit to lead the people across the Jordan into Palestine, into Canaan. Every great person in the Old Testament is possessed by the spirit of God. It's the spirit of God that's the hero, certainly according to Luke. And then the spirit of God departs with the death of John the Baptist. And then the second era of the spirit begins when the Spirit descends on Jesus, when you hear the voice, this is my beloved Son, it says the Spirit came rushing into him, the way it did to the prophets, the way it did to the judges of old. And it drove him out to the wilderness to confront Satan. The Spirit is active in Jesus. He's just the vessel for Luke. And through the Spirit, he cures people. And through the Spirit, he preaches. Constant reference to the Spirit. So the second era of the Spirit is the Spirit that enters Mary before, when Jesus is conceived, actually earlier than the baptism. It enters Mary, it impregnates her, the Spirit of God shall come upon you. It was with Jesus through his whole career and on the cross, what does he say? His last words on the cross in Luke, biyad cha afkid ruchi, which every Jew says on his deathbed, into thy hands, O Lord, I bequeathed my spirit, and he yielded up his spirit, and he died. That's the end of the second era of the spirit, according to Luke. But Jesus said, I send you someone to be with you, to lead the early Christian movement. And for 10 days after the ascension of Christ, they are bereft. 
But then we have Pentecost. And the spirit, they, they go up to the upper room where they spent the Passover meal with the Savior and they huddle together not knowing what to do. And suddenly the room is filled with a rushing wind because in Hebrew the word ruach means both wind and spirit. And the spirit, tongues of flame appear above their heads and they're given the gift of tongues to go out and, in the languages of the world to teach the gospel in the spirit, only because the spirit has come upon them, filled that room and filled them, and this is the third era of the spirit in which we live today. It is the Holy Spirit that guides the church, that you can feel in a good church service, no question about it, the ruach, the spirit. And it's alive today, guiding the church, and when Christ returns, that will be the end of the third era of the spirit. That's Luke's Gentile Christian Greek take on history. Three eras of the Spirit, and his gospel is the second era when the Spirit was here with us, among us, in Jesus Christ. But the operative thing in him is the Spirit, of which he is the vessel. So, that's the gospel. Those are the three synoptics. We're not talking about John here. Just give me one more minute, and we'll look at the last sheet we'll look at today, the handwritten one. The Markan Hypothesis. From the mid-19th century, this has been the dominant hypothesis of scholars of the New Testament. The Gospel of Mark, written in 70, 71 AD, in Rome, probably. It inspires Matthew to write a Jewish version of Mark, a Jewish expansion of Mark for Jewish audience. Almost no deletions, because Jews, when they come across a holy text, don't dare take out anything. He's got almost all of Mark. A few sentences gone, but everything else is there. Plus, it's a much longer gospel, with all this Jewish material added. Then, Luke, also based on Mark, aiming at Gentiles, adds material that Gentiles would find interesting, miracle stories. And... He doesn't hesitate as a Gentile. He doesn't have that Jewish reverence for the written text. As a Gentile, if he doesn't like something Mark says, he takes his scissors and he cuts it out, including the idea that the kingdom of God is at hand. Luke comes up with the idea that the kingdom of God will come, but after a long period, what he calls the age of the Gentiles, when the whole world will be converted to Christianity. Jesus will reign where'er the sun doth is, blah, blah, blah. From east to west, everybody will worship Christ. And then Christ will come back. And that'll be a long time from now. So when Mark says Jesus is coming back any moment, Luke takes his Greek scissors, cuts it right out, throws it away. And so he's consistent. He leaves only one mention of this quick expectation of the end. Maybe he overlooked it, I don't know. You know, during the war between the states, every federal eagle on the buildings in Charleston were torn down, except the one on the bank on Broad Street, just a block from the exchange. That eagle has been up there throughout the Confederate period, because I think no one noticed it, and they left it. So maybe Luke didn't notice one reference to the rapid return of Christ, and he leaves it in, but everything else He's cleansed it of that. Now it's a long rage process. He turned out to be right. We've been waiting 2,000 years. And those are both written in 85 AD. Now, also, where did Luke get his special stuff that's not in Matthew or, or, or Mark? He got it from the special Luke, Luke source, which we just call L. We don't know what it was. And where did Matthew get his special stuff that's not in Mark or Luke? He must have gotten it from the special Matthew source. We don't know what that was. Now, the kicker. If we find identical passages in Matthew and Luke that aren't in Mark, we hypothesize another source called Q, quella, which simply means source. The, The Q source is the source source, like pizza pie means pie pie. Q, was a saying source. Might have been Hebrew. 
assembled probably around the 50s AD of Jesus' sayings. It has been lost. No one can find it. But it's very easy to reconstruct its contents. How would we do that? You look at Matthew, you look at Luke. You find identical passages, but they're not in Mark. They must be from Q. So you put those passages together, and you've, redef you've reconstituted Q. And somehow it was lost, maybe we'll find it. But we know it from the, co from the context of Luke and Matthew. So that's the Markan hypothesis. Mark is the first gospel. Its structure of synopsis of scenes was picked up by Matthew and Luke, expanded in the Jewish way, a Gentile way. They added material special to them, and they added Q material. And that's how we got those three Gospels. John is another kettle of fish. He completely departs from Mark's synopsis and gives us something else. And if we're all alive here in five years, maybe I'll get around to teaching John. It's a very confused structure, and I prefer the synoptics. They're much neater. But all right. Uh, we will meet next week, and unless something happens, we'll meet every week for the rest of the summer. Eventually, I'm going to have surgery, but probably I want to wait till the end of this course to have it. So we'll go to the end of August, and we'll cover the Gospel of Mark. Thank you.